Sometimes you have moments of doubt where you think all this is useless and that none of this is meaningful. And what's the point of it all, especially the art? Because you're not a doctor saving a life, you are not a lawyer helping someone out of prison. You're simply an artist and you question your role in a place where injustice is everywhere. And you question whether what you're doing is of any value or of any meaning. It's this doubt that should keep us working. Because without this uncertainty, we will not find answers. We need this uncertainty. My work is inspired by Islamic art sometimes, but it's also concerned with where I live and the community in which I live the rights of women and humans in general and where in the places that I inhibit. And to me that started in a very physical, concrete way. It was not a conceptual uh, endeavor. As a woman who has decided to love and marry a man uh, from another nationality than mine, even though we both exist to the Arab world, I discovered that as a person, I have no right to give my daughters my passport. And to me, that was the ultimate form of injustice, where my identity and things that form me and the place that formed me as a human being is rejecting the continuity of my identity and rejecting the fact that I can pass it to my daughters. So the fact that we lack rights was not something that I looked at as an outsider, but something that I experienced firsthand. And that basic form of injustice, to me, made me aware of other forms of injustice on women, but also on other men and women in societies where people are deprived of their right to express. And any form of freedom of expression is uh, unwelcome. And to me, raising the voice of the feminine is not only raising the voice of women, but also raising the voice of la Raising the voice of the feminine is raising the voice of humanity in general because the feminine is what nurtures life. So when I was invited to reflect on the Aden, I decided to call the prayer using the voice of a young woman, mezzo-soprano, who was training at the Cairo Opera House because I felt that it was time for the voice of the feminine to rise and not meaning the voice only of women, but the voice of the collective feminine everywhere. I think art is a basic human need. It's a tool for social change. It's a tool for us to express emotions. It's a way for us to connect our, to our community and, and to connect our community to itself. Uh, it's a way for us to communicate with the other parts of the world. So, Culture is really a basic need. For example, if you take music, music can be felt by anyone, anywhere, even if you don't understand the lyrics. So art it transcends language, transcends borders. The audience of public art are the inhabitants of the city and there is no age limit, there is no ticket they need to buy because the city is theirs and art is accessible to everyone who can walk on the streets of the city. Let's say you're a young girl on her bus going to school at 8 o'clock in the morning. As her bus is driving by and she's looking outside the window of her bus, Instead of seeing a grey wall, imagine she sees a wall that is covered with painting. Any, whatever the theme is, whatever the colour is, whatever the topic is. And imagine that these walls or these uh, artworks are seen by everybody in the city. It will form the collective memory of the city because they will remember that this artwork exists in this place. It's a tool to connect the community to each other because it can become a meeting, a meeting place, it can be... It forms the memory of the, of the people living in the city uh, and it gives them a collective memory together. As somebody who practices uh, art on the street or public uh, forms of art, 
the fact that our work gets erased is part of the whole narrative. When the artwork gets erased, it says a lot about the city and the power dynamics of the city. So if you are painting a wall in a certain area and somebody decides to cover it, they are telling you, we don't want to hear you. You're not welcome here. What you're saying is of no significance. Um, versus if you paint it in another place in the city where the artwork remains or lives or is celebrated by the people who live in that city when it takes another form and another life and another identity of maybe them taking a photo of the wall, sharing it on social media, uh, maybe the different media outlets circulating the artwork, a journalist talking about the artwork. So the, all these are forms of bringing life to a war to an artwork on the street that could otherwise have been covered. It all depends on the power dynamics in the city, control of the city, control of the messages of the city. So out of the many cities that I have visited, I think the poor, in the poorer neighborhoods, you tend to have more opportunity to spray than in the richer neighborhoods that have cameras everywhere, security cards everywhere, and where the messaging and the look of the city is extremely controlled. So, and it's always interesting to navigate these spaces within the city and understand the, the, the hidden social borders within the city. So what is allowed and what is not allowed? Where can you paint and where are you not allowed to paint? Uh, all of these are ideas that you explore uh, as an artist, um, as an artist on the street whose work gets covered or celebrated. So you are, you are on both ends of the spectrum. There are times in history when you have to deal with big ideas that maybe are beyond your grasp at the moment. In history, you need 50 or 100 years to understand until all of the pieces of the puzzle fall into place because you cannot judge a moment in the moment. As historians, we look back and you have to study all the factors and sometimes some of the factors only appear much later in time. So before you can understand and collect all this data, you are stuck with your emotions because the mind cannot still work. The mind is busy collecting data and until that data comes you have your emotions to deal with. You have emotions of anger, you have emotions of loss, you have emotions of disorientation and to me art is, is the grounding power um, that helps us navigate all that. Poetry is the best way for us to understand or to accept or to tolerate ideas that are sometimes intolerable. Um, and poetry came to my aid in around 2015 when there was a lot of changes taking place. So I started reading the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, who is the Palestinian poet of resistance because I felt that we, he kind of summarized everything that we are going through and still going through in the Arab world today. So all of the themes that the Palestinian people have uh, struggled with, whether issues on identity, loss of land, accessibility, colonization, and I think uh, he dealt with all of these themes uh, early on and he gave a shortcut for many people in the Arab world who can relate to what, what is still going on through his poetry, but also his poetry speaks to humanity at large and not just people from the Arab world. The first poem I painted, I painted was in Vancouver and it read, uh, stand at the corner of a dream and fight. And I think at the time it was a message to myself rather than to anyone else. It was a makeshift stencil, it was painted very quickly on the street. But I had this urge to keep painting because I felt that um, I had this need to communicate and connect. It started in Vancouver and then three years later, I had painted in 15 different cities around the world from Tokyo to Hawaii to Beirut. 
these different cities where I was painting poetry by Mahmoud Darwish were also visual expressions on how can we draw Arabic letters. Not just that are inspired by history, but I wanted to create Arabic letters of the future. How can we bring Arabic as a language and as letter forms into the now and into today and into the future? And most of these walls were uh, typographic and calligraphic experimentation on pushing the boundaries of the shapes of Arabic letters. Seeing a wall in a city where Arabic is not spoken in Arabic might seem frightening to some. I mean, seeing a big mural painted in black and white in big Arabic letters, uh, because of the way the media has been working for years now and because of mass uh, brainwashing, the view on the region is through a very uh, uh, doctored lens, let's say. And my hope through these painted walls in Arabic is to maybe provide an alternative narrative to what the mainstream media is providing. So uh, if you see a wall that's painted in orange in Amsterdam and is written in Arabic, um, I think you might be curious to ask, what's this or what is this about or why does it look like uh, squares or why is it painted like circles? And is this really Arabic? And then what is Arabic? And why is it? Why are you painting Mahmoud Darwish? So I don't think I, the walls are meant to be statements. They are rather there to raise questions and raise curiosity. I think I started using the poetry and the walls as a way to deal with issues that I felt were out of control. So the people who are every day drowning at sea, for years have been drowning at sea, and we do nothing about it. So I painted a wall in Kefalonia in Greece that reads, those who have no land have no sea. It's not saving anyone from drowning at sea, but at least I've painted a message that says people are drowning at sea, and it's not their fault. When somebody is a few kilometers away from you, dying because they are underprivileged, they have no access to knowledge, they have no access to wealth, they have no access to food. Uh, it, is, it is kind of our responsibility to say something about it, right? That of uh, reflection. Because when everybody is making and consuming and running and in the wheel, you need some of us to sit back and just reflect on it all, to, to see what's going on and uh, how is it going on uh, and what is our take on it. Where should we pause and why? Because pausing sometimes is also important. You can't keep running, you need to stop and reflect. I think it would be to inspire and to to communicate that there is more than material things to life, that we are not here just to uh, eat, marry and die, that there are bigger ideas, that there are uh, bigger aspirations that we'd, we should be all looking at and dreaming of. It would be a very sad life if we are just here to consume. But I understand the challenges in, in our part of the world in, in a post-colonial condition uh, where these ideas, where people are extremely encouraged to consume. Why can't we encourage them to consume culture also? It is a form of consumption, isn't it? So. TED Countdown is bringing together um, governments and major players to cut down on green gas emission uh, globally. They are engaging um, different actors in society in different parts of the world uh, on this conversation. And uh, through fine acts they invited 10 artists to develop works of art reflecting on the environment uh, from 10 different cities. Um, and I was selected to represent Cairo. So I created an artwork 
reflecting on the region and the heritage of the region, but also what are we doing for the future of that. And the artwork is entitled Pyramids of Garbage. And the concept behind it is that for 7,000 years, this part of the world has been inspiring the world with its culture. And we hope that the world does not leave us with pyramids of garbage. And the pyramid of garbage was actually collected and assembled in Cairo's garbage city. And it was developed in collaboration with uh, the school that is in the garbage city and the garbage collectors. So it was uh, a group effort in, in its construction process. What was important about that experience for me um, is not just the fact of the artwork and the statement, but also the different audiences that this artwork will be speaking to. Uh, it, was during, it was assembled during COVID, so there was no way we could invite people to the place. But at the same time, the, the artwork was properly documented and shared with audiences all around the world through the TED platform. So this then creates the question, where is the public? With the technology that we have today, do we really need to have a physical public for our ideas to be transmitted? And with the experiment of the pyramids of garbage, what we were trying to do is emit a message, even though our audience is not physically present with us, uh, but through filming and through uh, documenting the idea and sharing it with uh, different audiences in different parts of the world, the physicality of the audience was no longer um, very important but the idea and transmitting the idea becomes what's important. Art cannot exist in void, and artists cannot create art to keep in their drawers, as tempting as that might be. Art should belong in an ecosystem. You can't, artists can't have a conversation with themselves all the time. Um, and this conversation takes place by creating spaces where artists can present their ideas and get uh, feedback on their reflections. And they can get polarizing reactions. They can get people who really despise their art and they're going to get people who really love their art. And it really doesn't matter where the reaction falls on the spectrum but it's important for artists to have, the, to have this conversation with their community, to see whether they are on the right track, whether they are really reflecting in a manner that is sensitive and that summarizes the time, or if they are simply talking to themselves. You need governments, you need patrons, you need institutions, and you need the public. And when all of these things come together, then art becomes relevant. So if you're lacking many of these structures, artists become very lonely. Their work becomes very lonely. I think it's a very difficult task to be an artist from the Arab world today because you are sometimes asked to also explain things that are Art is like a snapshot of the time, if I am to say that. So artists summarize certain ideas, notions, expressions of their time. And this is why their work becomes relevant because they are a product of their society and they are a product of their time. I look at designers in the 60s and the 70s in the Arab world and I'm really fascinated on how they were trying to visualize identity. And it was very inspiring how they were trying, how they were trying to create a new visual language that visualizes what the Arab world should look like. And how do we form a new Arab identity? What is a new Arab identity becomes the question. Are we Islamic? Are we Coptic? Are we ancient Egyptians? Are we Phoenicians? Uh, are we Berber? Are we nomads? Uh, should we live in tents? Uh, should we construct more temples? 
How do you summarize what an Arab is or who, who an Arab is and how do you communicate that to the rest of the world? And that becomes the role of culture, cultural producers in general, whether artists, designers, authors, musicians. How can you shape that identity and still stand equally to other actors in the world, to other nations of the world? Um, if, you, if the Arab world was a logo, what would it be? What color would it be? Uh, and, and that is a very interesting exercise uh, that I like to work around with my students. So how do you shape something that is new, even though a lot already exists? But how do you summarize it and how do you represent it to the world? Because we're all global citizens now, whether we like it or not. We're all on social media. We all have profiles. We all communicate with the whole world every day, every morning. This is what we do. We wake up and we read our news feeds and we share our life with everyone else. So how do you curate what you look like online? And this is an exercise I think is for the younger generation. This is an exercise that already the younger generation has been playing with from some of them from the day they were born, where they are forced to shape who they are and what they look like to the whole world. So what is the role of artists in that? And how are we as cultural producers from the Arab world representing what this world stands for when everybody is doing it every day on social media? So how do you, how do you inspire the collective? And how do you form an identity within that collective? that is still true to where you are, but again, not less than the other. In 1994, when I joined uh, the American University in Beirut as a student, uh, the library was uh, bombed. But to me, the memory of the bombed building was formative, um, and it made me feel that nothing is set. Even our most respected centers of knowledge, uh, our religious structures, uh, all those buildings in a war, in a civil war, the certainty of their survival um, is not there. And then the war in Syria started and we started seeing systematic um, loss of cultural heritage and before that in Iraq and before that in Palestine and, be, and in Lebanon. So all my life I grew up witnessing structures being destroyed. Um, and then in Cairo I used to take my students to the Islamic Museum and even that got bombed and destroyed. So not just libraries, not just historic structures, but also museums. So you end up feeling like nothing is certain anymore. And how do you preserve memory when you don't have structures that build these memories? So if this is being destroyed on different levels and in different parts of the Arab world, how do we pass on our knowledge to the next generation? It becomes really hard for every generation to come and rebuild everything from scratch. All of their ideas on identity, on belonging, on country, on nation. It becomes as if they are just plowing the land again and starting all over again. Museums are learning spaces. They're not spaces to display things. They are spaces for us to take students, family, friends, and have conversations and reflect on things. So visiting a museum is like reading a book or going to the movies, except you are discussing ideas that were generated by artists from a different time. And if these artists belong to you and your land, and this is their work that you are discussing, this is how you secure the continuity of their ideas. Because artists are, as we said, a screenshot of their time or a representation of their time, they also summarize in a way the identity of the time, uh, the visual language of the time, the sentiment of the time, the reason of the reasoning of the time. 
I don't perceive heritage as a burden. I perceive heritage as a toolbox, something that we can build on, something that we can change, and something that is alive. I don't look at heritage as something just from the past because we see traces of it in everything we do in our life. We are the heritage. It is how we translate this heritage and how do we create the solutions of the future. This heritage does not become a burden because you can also step away from it. You can create what you can create whatever inspires you or speaks to you uh, if you feel that heritage is a burden. Since 2019, I haven't been able to paint a wall anywhere around the world, and I really miss that. Um, the walls became spaces of conversations, so I would meet young scholars in Antwerp, or artists, or curators, or painters, or people who work on the street and they would pass by the wall and we would have a conversation and they would have a conversation and the walls become spaces of connection and after the pandemic I lost all that and because that conversation was lost I was looking for different spaces of expression and connection what would you die for is a 56 uh, screen video installation and I felt that this does not need to be one vision by one artist. Since we have that beautiful space, why don't I invite students from different universities to also reflect on the idea of death and what would they die for? And it was really a beautiful exercise for me to see uh, my students and students in different parts of the world reflecting on what they would die for. And it was really interesting to see that they really, when they put together, when the student work is put together, it creates a beautiful mosaic of ideas uh, by a different generation and their concepts of dying and their concepts of death. Sometimes the idea is very basic, but because we are moving so fast in this life, this, this basic idea can become blurred and manipulated. And it's always good to stop and really think on what are really the things that we are willing to leave this earth for. I thought that the ultimate form of persuasion is when you can convince someone to give up their life. An interesting journey exploring the different concepts of why people die. So the artwork became an exploration on that spectrum of death. So on one hand, you have people being mentally manipulated and um, led to believe that they are serving the greater good of the nation, of the country, and dying for that idea, and giving up their life for that idea. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are again also willingly dying, but to save someone else's life. And navigating that gray space in between these two extremes of black and white was an extremely interesting exercise because a lot of themes emerged. Ideas like mothers who kill their children, for example, where would you put those on the spectrum? Uh, or children who kill their parents. Doctors, nurses, especially now in COVID, how are these people literally giving up their life every day to save the lives of others? Policemen, firemen and women, how are these human beings also every day waking up and going to their job knowing that they might lose their life and still they do it. Ideas on consumerism, how are we consuming, how are we building our city, how are we changing the face of this planet by the decisions that we are ma making every day in consumption, in buying, in um, changing the temperature of this planet by our actions. So ideas on death and this spectrum of death from the micro mother child to the big mother earth uh, and everything in between is what the artwork is trying to communicate. For me, art is a reaction 
to what is going on. It's no longer about me in, in a way. It's really about my community or the people around me and what's going on around me. My art is not an introspective reflection on, on life, but rather a reaction to what I'm seeing. And my art is what helps me deal with it.